Hello guys, today we'll be covering a 2022 Spanish thriller TV series called Welcome to Eden. All the relevant links and information for the film will be in the pinned comment below. Now, let's get right into it. The story begins on a large deserted island in the middle of the ocean. By the looks of it, this might be the first time humans have set foot on its soil. We are then introduced to a woman named Zoa, who does not seem to remember how she got herself in this place. This frustrates her, and she starts exploring the island, hoping to find other people there. Moments later, Zoa stumbles down to the beach where she finds an empty bottle that reads Eden on the side. And as she picks it up, she gets a flashback to the events that led to her isolation. But to understand how Zoa got on the island, let's go back to a few days ago when it all began. Zoa lives in Barcelona with her younger sister, Gabby, and their father, who tends to be with his girlfriend most of the time. And because of this, their mother is mostly out of the picture. One day, when Zoa is chilling in her room, she receives a strange message from an unknown number. She initially thinks that it's just a scammer, but Zoa decides to respond to the stranger despite her suspicions. When she inquires who she's talking to, the stranger reveals that they're representing a new beverage company called Eden. And since Zoa received the text from them, she's been selected to attend the company's launch party. Furthermore, the stranger adds that the event is being held on a remote island, but since the trip is fully paid for, Zoa can attend the event without hesitation. The twinkle in her eyes signifies that Zoa is delighted by this blatantly dubious offer because she's always wanted to get inside the trunk of a stranger's car. Before Zoa can accept the invitation, the stranger sends her a couple of rules that must be followed at any cost. Rule number one, do not disclose the event's location to anyone. And number two, do not bring anyone along to the party. Zoa finds the rules a little weird and quite unnecessary but she eventually agrees to the stranger's demand for fear of losing the invitation. A few days later, Zoe gets ready in her rad outfit and heads toward the pickup location. But despite agreeing to the company's rules, she invites her best friend Judith to come along with her and they make their way to the secret location. When the girls reach the pickup point, they meet a guy named Aldo who's also invited to the island event. As they introduce themselves, an automated drone leads the trio to an abandoned building the drone guides them for some time, but it swiftly leaves the scene and the confused trio is forced to navigate their way by themselves. They're stopped in their tracks by a locked door, so Judith bangs on the door and calls if anyone is inside. A few moments later, a millennial Kakashi opens the door and invites them inside the building with grace. It turns out that all the invitees are already present in the venue, where they chat and socialize with each other. Soon, exquisite party buses make their way inside the place, and the invitees race into the vehicle. As they're being driven to their destination, they spend their night partying and dancing. The next day, the invitees are dropped off at an unknown seaport, where the company's men guide them to the boat. But before they can enter, all attendees are required to pass through a verification checkpoint. Judith is nervous to go through this process since she was not invited officially. However, she realizes that there's no going back at this point and decides to try out her luck. Fortunately for her, the gamble pays off and Judith is allowed to attend the company's party without an official invitation. The entire thing already feels sketchy and now the guests are thoroughly searched and asked to pass through a metal detector. They're also forced to give up their cell phones which is particularly hard for Africa, who's a famous social media influencer. After all the necessary preparations, everyone gets on board and begins their trip to this mysterious island. The guests are overjoyed with excitement, and everyone seems very comfortable with each other. And a few hours later, they get a glimpse of their destination. Next, the guests arrive at the island, and they're each given a wristband by the company employees. Now that they're finally on this long-awaited island, everyone starts partying and spending the night drinking and dancing. During the event, Zoa runs into a fellow invitee named David, and in a matter of minutes, the two eventually start making out. While the party's underway, the head organizer Astrid makes a grand announcement. She tells everyone that the company invited a total of 100 people for the launch party. Out of those 100 guests, only 5 people will be randomly selected to try out their new energy drink. Africa, Ebon, Charlie, Aldo, and Zoa are the chosen candidates, and they're each given a mysterious drink. After gulping down the beverage, they all return to partying. In the next scene, Judith is seen looking for her friend Zoa, but she's nowhere to be found. As she's strolling around, Judith sees a tent on the island shore, and when she gets close to it, she sees two of the organizers attacking and drowning a man in a water barrel. 
Judith gets terrified seeing this, but since she's on the island without a proper invitation, she decides to let it slide and continues searching for Zoa. On the other hand, Zoa is having an intense reaction to the mysterious drink. She starts hallucinating, and the bright lights don't help her either. The drink seems to function like a drug and makes everything disorienting and hard to follow. After some struggle, Zoa makes her way to the top of the cliff while still struggling to regain her senses. While fighting back the hallucination, she almost falls off the cliff. But just then, a strange man arrives at the scene and saves her. Zoa wakes up the next day feeling a little off as she passed out on the cliff the last night. We are now at the beginning of the story, where Zoa wakes up alone and wanders the island in search of other people. After almost an hour of wandering around, Zoa eventually runs into the four other guests that were chosen to try the mysterious energy drink. But none of them seems to know what happened last night. Realizing that the only way is forward, they all team up and decide to navigate through the island in hopes of finding some clues. But they soon realize that the boats they arrived in are already gone, leaving them stranded AF. Next, the group tries to come up with a plan to escape the island, just when a drone hovers around them. Since it's the only familiar thing they know, they all decide to follow the drone across the lush paradise. Eventually, they're guided into a huge compound that lies just across their party site. When the group reaches the scene, they see a whole bunch of men and women standing before them. At first look, this looks to be some sort of Walmart cult, given they're all wearing similar outfits. But soon, Astrid introduces her as the leader of the village and welcomes the stranded group to this modern civilization. She claims that the company's boat, unfortunately, left without them. But Astrid assures them that another boat will come to their rescue in a few days. And in the meantime, she even offers the stranded group a place to live. On the other hand, we see a fun party environment on the boat. One of the boys, David, realizes that Zoa and Judith are not on board and tells the captain he needs to go back to the island. But the captain refuses and assures David that everything will be fine. On the island, Zoa feels relieved after hearing Astrid's affirmations, but she's still worried about her friend Judith. Now, all five guests are sent to a separate apartment space where they'll be sharing the place with other fellow residents. When Zoa reaches her apartment, she meets her new roommates, Claudia and Nick. Claudia seems a little off from the beginning, whereas Nick introduces himself as the guy who saved Zoa from falling off the cliff last night. She immediately expresses her gratitude and thanks him for saving her life. Since Nick is topless for the right reason, the two start flirting with each other. While Zoa and Nick are joking around, Claudia seems quite reserved and just watches them from a distance. The next day, the group is handed new clothes to wear, citing it'll be easier to get around. But we all know something else is cooking here. When they ask a community member when the boat's going to arrive, he reveals that since the tides are too strong right now, the boats will have to wait a few more days. Even though this news sucks, there's nothing the group can do about this. And since they're relatively safer in this place, they don't even question the community's intentions. But there's always a breaking point. Aldo starts becoming suspicious about the island's activities and is conflicted about the organizer's true intentions. The next morning, as the inhabitants are strolling around, Zoa notices a man named Orson. She knows him from somewhere but cannot figure out exactly where he's from. But eventually, Zoa remembers that the guy was talking with Judith on the night they arrived on the island. Since Orson is the only link she has to her friend, Zoa approaches him and asks him about her friend's whereabouts. But Orson does not just deny talking to Judith. He even threatens Zoa to stop asking stupid questions. Seeing his aggressive nature, Zoa becomes more concerned about her friend's safety. Later, when Zoa goes to the main compound, she sees all the inhabitants participating in a weird therapy session. The community leader, Astrid, notices her and even encourages her to join the session. Zoa seems to be conflicted about joining this ritualistic event, but after some convincing, she ends up being a part of it. As part of the therapy, Astrid asks her a bunch of questions about her childhood and family life. She even inquires about Zoa's past traumas, and in the flow of the moment, she ends up sharing some troubling memories from her past. Zoa reveals that her mother was a heroin addict, while her father was never around to spend time with her. And because she has a younger sister named Gabby, Zoa was handed the responsibility of taking care of her, even though she was also just a kid. For the first time in ages, Zoa feels relieved after sharing her traumas and hugs Astrid for helping her. But on the other side, the employees in the control room use this intel to text Gabby from Zoa's phone to stop her from growing suspicious of her disappearance. However, Gabby becomes enraged with her sister after reading the message and dismisses it. Early morning the next day, 
their group is informed that the boat will arrive within 24 hours to take them home. Naturally, everyone seems to be happy about this news, except for Aldo. He wants to leave the island on his own terms and is very clear about his distrust toward the island authorities. Now that they have just a few hours to spend on the island, the rest of the group starts spending their time with the locals. Zoa has started to get chummy with Nick as they talk about their past and family life, whereas Ebon flaunts his piano skills and finds himself locking spirits with a fellow inhabitant. Since the group is leaving tomorrow, Astrid and her husband Eric throws a farewell party to celebrate the wonderful time they spent on the island. While everyone is distracted by the party, Aldo decides to scan the island one last time before leaving. And like he suspected, Aldo notices some men offloading cargo boxes at the shore. Seeing this as a chance to escape the island, he hurries to the party to notify his group. He sees Charlie and immediately tells him about the escape plan, but Charlie is heavily drunk. So Aldo decides to escape the island on his own. Next, Aldo manages to escape the eyes of the island authorities and sneaks down the rocks. On the way, he hears several workers discussing how they're not actually bothered by climate change, and they even claim that the Eden Foundation pays a good amount. Off the island, we see Gabby worried about her sister's disappearance. She speaks to her mother about this, but she simply shrugs it off, saying Zoa will pop up soon. Unfortunately, this response does not help Gabby's mood, who remains more worried. Once Aldo gets inside this rugged-looking boat, he hides among the cargo. After a long time, we see Aldo finally letting out a smile on his face. Then he wakes a few hours later when he hears the sound of the engine failing. Curious about the boat's condition, Aldo climbs out to the upper deck to investigate. But to his surprise, he finds himself at the mercy of one of the uniformed islanders. She pulls out a strange gun that looks like a weird telescope. Then she places it on Aldo's forehead and pulls the trigger without hesitation, killing him in cold blood. The woman then heads toward the island carrying his dead body in the boat. Meanwhile, it's revealed that the island is, in fact, a weird sanctuary for the members of a strange cult. Astrid is the leader of this universe, and she instructs the inhabitants of this island to convince the guests to remain on the island forever. But the reason still remains unknown. The day is sunny and cheerful because today, the guests are finally going home. Zoa barges out of her apartment and wakes up her friends, but she does not seem to find Aldo anywhere. At this point, Charlie remembers that Aldo came up to him last night urging him to escape the island. They realize that Aldo either escaped or is dead somewhere, but whatever the case is, the group is now conflicted about what to do next. Finally, Zoa has now started suspecting the island's inhabitants. The farewell day looks a little different on this island because Astrid is working overtime to convince the guests to stay on the island forever. They offer the guests everything on the island for free, and for that, all they need to do is sign on a contract paper. Eventually, after relentless persuading from the local inhabitants, Africa, the influencer, and Ebon decide to live on the island from now on. To solidify their commitment, they sign a contract paper, which now binds them to the mysterious cult. Over in Barcelona, Gabby and her mother work together and team up with an officer to discuss Zoa's disappearance. They report her officially as a missing person and get the ball rolling on the case. But since their addict mother does not show much effort, Gabby's frustrated and starts going through Zoa's room in hopes of finding some clues. Eventually, she finds Zoa's phone while sifting through her room. I don't know where the phone came from either. Your guess is as good as mine, my friend. However, when Gabby goes through the phone, she notices a text from a guy named David who met her at the island party. When Gabby informs him of the situation, David tells her everything about the night he spent with Zoa and the mysterious remote island trip. Gabby's committed to finding her sister at any cost, so she schedules a meeting with David to explore more about this mysterious island. Over on the island, the inhabitants are gathered up for their routine group therapy session. This time, Charlie's the one pouring out his story in front of other residents. He talks about how he drowned his own baby sister by accident. And ever since that day, Charlie's been carrying a weight on his chest. He further reveals that he's had a troubling relationship with his mother because she blames him for her daughter's death. Hearing this disturbing story, Astrid continues with her default messaging, saying that everything's going to work out fine. But Zoa has had enough of her wokeness. She points out that she can see through her misleading antics and berates her for manipulating her friends into staying on the island against their will. Next, Zoa fires off from the compound and walks toward the island shore to cool down. Nick approaches her from behind and tells her that she'll never walk alone, spoken like a true copite. Anyway, Nick warns her that the cult won't allow anyone to leave the island 
and asks her not to make any rash decisions. But Zoa is unable to process the fact that she's trapped on a remote island when she asks him for more information. Nick tells her to meet him later that night if she wants the details. But as he leaves, Nick instructs Zoa to leave her wristband by her bedside before she leaves the room. Later that night, Nick takes her inside a huge cave and shines the light on a corpse lying on the ground. When Zoa sees the body, she's devastated to find out that it's her best friend, Judith. It seems as if Nick brought her to this place to show her what happens if you ask too many questions. In the next scene, we see a flashback in which Judith is being captured by Orson and the island's executioner named Brenda. The helpless Judith begs them to let her go and cries her eyes out, but not a single soul can hear her except the two islanders. Then Brenda pulls the trigger and kills Judith with a strange weapon before dropping her off the cliff. In the present, Zoa goes into a mournful state after witnessing the horrific scene of her best friend's death. She stays in bed all day long and writes Judith Forever on the bed with a screwdriver. Later that evening, the island is expected to be struck by a powerful storm. So, to prevent any casualties, everyone present on the island decides to spend their night together in the central module despite their differences. While most of them manage to get inside the module in time, Charlie is not so lucky. When a lightning bolt takes out one of the lampposts, Charlie almost gets hit and is sent flying across the courtyard, crash landing on the ground. As a result, he's immediately sent to the island clinic where a doctor gives him a shot. Luckily, Charlie got away from suffering any serious damage, but he still needs to spend some time inside the hospital. On the other hand, Zoa is tired of staying indoors and goes outside the module to get some air. She meets an islander named Belle, and the two start sharing their experiences on the island. Eventually, Belle slips out a little inside information about the cult. She reveals that once a new batch of guests arrive on the island, each one of them is assigned to a specific local inhabitant called Link, whose only duty is to convince the guests to stay on the island. Furthermore, Belle reveals that Zoa's Link is Nick and sternly warns her to stay away from his hypnotism. Hearing this, Zoa is now seriously conflicted as to who she should trust in this place. But first, she goes straight to confront Nick and berates him for taking advantage of her kindness and manipulating her. At this point, Nick realizes that a local islander leaked their cult secret to a commoner. But since he's forced to maintain his composure, Nick denies Zoa's accusation. In the next scene, we see Nick talking to Astrid about his recent incident with Zoa. But when he gives out the details, Astrid reveals that the elite members of the island deliberately plan to murder Judith and display her corpse to Zoa. Nick does not understand the logic behind this, but the plan was to make Zoa surrender out of fear. However, the plan seems to have turned against them, because ever since Zoa saw her friend's dead body, she's become more vengeful and determined to leave the island. Astrid hears Nick's argument and realizes that she must have underestimated Zoa. And now, she wants to get rid of her permanently. Astrid orders Jeffrey, the island's security in charge, to bring Zoa to their apartment. When he arrives with Zoa, Astrid orders Brenda to drill a hole in her skull. At this point, Zoa realizes that she cannot escape the island if she's dead, so she promises the cult leader to stay on the island forever. Good move. Since this is exactly what Astrid wanted from her, she decides to give Zoa a chance to improve her attitude. Next, Zoa returns to the central module and is chatting with Nick about her decision to stay on the island. But as they talk, she realizes that Nick was the one who ratted her. This frustrates Zoa and she humiliates him for being a manipulator who's not capable of honesty. Later that night, Zoa waits for everyone to fall asleep. She has an ambitious but risky plan in mind. When everyone in the module is sleeping, Zoa walks with a screwdriver in her hands and approaches Nick to stab him to death. But just then, her quiet roommate Claudia appears in the scene and stops her. Meanwhile, one of the island's elite, Mia, visits Charlie at the hospital. The two share some alone time together, and since they complement each other well, Mia invites the stud to her apartment. Charlie gladly accepts this invitation, but since the young couple is already locked in, they get intimate in the hospital. In the next scene, we see Zoa and Charlie sharing their disagreements towards the cult island. Claudia gets comfortable with her and reveals how her boyfriend was brainwashed by the cult members. When he tried to escape the island one day, the guards murdered him. Ever since that day, Claudia is waiting patiently for the opportunity to escape the island. She informs Zoa that the island brings in a new batch of guests every month on a boat. After dropping them off, the boat returns to bring a new batch the next month. Now Claudia plans to get on the boat to escape since this is the only way anyone can go in and out of the island. 
Zoa finds her plan quite impressive and a lot less risky than hers, so she also plans to join Claudia's escape mission. Next, Zoa catches up with her party bus buddies, Charlie and Ebon, and tells them about all the shady things that are happening on the island. One could even argue that these men are a little dim-witted, because how could they not get a hint already? The boys are shocked to hear about the deception and murder in this place, so they immediately plan on escaping the island. This is when Zoa shares Claudia's escape plan with them, and upon realizing there actually is a plan, the boys agree to join in as well. Later that evening, Astrid and Eric organize yet another party to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. When Eric is expressing his love for his beloved wife on stage, someone hacks the island server and displays a death threat targeted at Astrid. And with this message, ladies and gentlemen, the rebellion has begun. Since this is the first time the elite class is threatened on the island, a meeting is held immediately to discuss this matter in depth. Because the threat was digital, everyone has their eyes on Mia, who's the head of the tech department. However, Mia is equally frustrated because this hacker is extremely skilled and there's no way for them to track the hacker's digital footprints. Astrid is not used to getting a no for an answer, so she loses her cool and decides to send out a message to the hacker nonetheless. Since her IT department is kind of whack, Astrid decides to randomly punish one inhabitant of the island to assert her dominance. Then the members of the committee are asked to nominate a candidate for a sacrifice. Several names are brought forward. But first, they decide to debate the rebellious kid, Zoa. After some heated back and forth, the committee eventually decides not to sacrifice her. But since Astrid is adamant about killing an islander anyhow, Claudia's name is brought up. In this case, no one seems to defend her name because ever since her partner was murdered, she's become vengeful and a threat to the island elites. The next morning, Orson and the executioner barge inside Zoa's loft and forcefully arrest Claudia. Zoa tries to clap back at them for imposing unnecessary rules on the people, but the elite soldiers have no intention of stopping. As they walk Claudia to the execution zone, other members of the island stand back and watch their fellow islander being dragged to her death. When they reach the assassination zone, Brenda takes out her stupid-looking weapon once again. And just like that, for the sake of setting an example, the elites kill Claudia. Back in the city, David happens to have one of the wristbands from the party. He smuggled it out when the others had to give them back to the island authorities. When Gabby puts it on her wrist, the band flashes up with an error message down on the island, which Mia notices when she returns to her desk. Meanwhile, Gabby is not the only one on the hunt, as the authorities are also working overtime to find out what's going on. On top of that, Ebon's father has hired a private investigator to find his son. That night, while David is out strolling around the city, he's kidnapped by the island's city agents. Then they take him to an undisclosed location and tie him up before questioning about the wristband signal. Like every abduction scene, David is asked to spit out the wristband's whereabouts, but he refuses to snitch. But when the kidnappers threaten him with his mother's photo, David has no option but to give out the information about Gabby and her plans. After getting the information they needed, the agents kill David without a second thought. Back at the island, Zoa, Ebon, Charlie, and Africa are made to walk through a ramp filled with hot coals on their bare feet. At the end of the ramp, they're given a star-shaped pendant as a reward. This gruesome ritual is how the islanders are officially vetted as loyal members of the cult. After the ramp walk, they're given a star tattoo as well so that they can permanently get associated with the cult. It's not quite certain what the star tattoos signify, but from Eric's cryptic chatter, we find out that the first level requires great commitment. Level 2 allows you a seat on the committee, while Eric and Astrid are the only ones who have achieved level 3, which appears to be reserved for the cult leaders. Just then, Jeffrey is given a three-star tattoo, which qualifies him as an equal to Astrid and Eric. Days pass by, and the rebellion that sort of began a few weeks ago is now as good as dead. One day when Zoa and Belle are chatting by the seaside, Belle reveals that she's the leader of an underground rebel government. She plans on overthrowing the current cult leaders and asks Zoa to join her cause as well. However, Zoa has no plans on staying on the island, and instead she shares her escape plan with Belle, hoping to change her mind. That night, a mysterious man breaks into Astrid's bedroom with a knife in his hand. He immediately covers Astrid's mouth to suffocate her, but Eric notices the intruder and jumps out of bed to attack him. Now the two start fighting in the dark, and since the intruder has a knife, the fight does not end well for Eric. Astrid tries to intervene, but the man easily tosses her around. As the intruder makes his way out, he pins the knife in Eric's gut. Wasting no time, Astrid grabs her husband and rushes to the hospital. However, the couple does not go to the nearby island clinic, as Eric's condition could cause an uproar in the community. So they drive to a remote patch of land 
where we're introduced to a young boy named Isaac. Isaac seems to be well informed about medicine and he immediately attends to Eric's wounds. In a matter of minutes, Isaac stitches the wound and stabilizes his condition. A few days later, Astrid summons the members of the committee and informs them that a new batch of invitees is arriving on the island in a few days. But she's careful not to mention the intruder incident in front of this mass, as it could badly ruin their leadership position. Then Astrid assigns each committee head a unique department to decentralize the power for the time being. When the committee relays this information to the locals, Charlie and Zoa are now on high alert since this is their long-awaited opportunity to escape the island. They immediately start working on their escape plan, but unfortunately, both of them are assigned a job that day. Even if they manage to sneak out of their job, they'll be under constant surveillance, making the escape practically impossible. Zoe gets frustrated to learn this news, and she takes a car and head towards the seashore to cool off. Moments later, Belle arrives at the scene, and when she sees Zoa upset, she offers to create a distraction at the party to help her escape. Hearing this, Zoa realizes how much risk Bella is taking for her and thanks her. Eventually, the couple starts teasing each other on the sand and has a steamy makeout session. Next, we see a boat full of energetic people approaching the island as the sun shines bright in the sky. And as the freshers make their way to the island, the party commences. Zoa and Charlie are assigned as volunteers, but they're closely monitored by the elites. They cannot afford to make a mistake at this stage, so for hours, Zoa and Charlie patiently attend to their roles. A few hours later, Belle convinces her rebels to create a distraction at the party by creating a short circuit in the electrical board. As a result, panic ensues in the crowd and everyone starts running in different directions. Seeing this as the perfect opportunity to blend in with the crowd, Charlie rushes to the island shores where he finds an oxygen tank. Immediately, he uses it and dives into the water, inching towards the boat. When Charlie finally climbs on the boat, he's spotted by the surveillance drone. Initially, Charlie thinks that he got busted by the island elites, but fortunately for him, the drone is being operated by his lover, Mia. However, Mia is now forced to choose between her lover and her loyalty to the island, but she cannot let herself betray the person she's in love with. So Mia helps Charlie escape and turns the drone away from him. In the next scene, we see Zoa trying to make her escape as well. But while she's at it, Jeffrey spots her in the act and brutally attacks her. The leader sees this as a disrespect to the cult and tries to choke her. But just then, Ebon arrives at the scene and pushes Jeffrey aside. Then a fight ensues between the two men and they land heavy blows on each other's faces. After a while, Ebon manages to tire him out and drowns him in the ocean. Now that the coast is all clear, Zoa jumps in the water and swims towards the boat. As she looks at the people on board, she's shocked to see her baby sister, Gabby, among other people. With a confused look on her face, Zoa watches her sister being driven to the beach party. As the story ends, we see Zoa suspended in the ocean, trying to figure out her next strategy.